The Peter Schiff Show. The Dow rose a little over 180 points today, closing above 26,000, 26,031, spot 81 to be exact, for the first time during this bear market rally. I mean, I still believe that we are in a bear market rally, uh, not a new bull market. And the catalyst, I think, for today's stock market strength, and it was across the board, uh, the markets were strong from the opening bell to the closing bell. Uh, I think the high in the Dow was maybe up just above 200. I think we sold off uh, intraday, but you know, never really were up much less than 100 points. But NASDAQ, uh, Russell 2000, also higher. On, again, optimism that there is going to be a trade deal between the U.S. and China. Donald Trump is saying that he is negotiating the greatest deal ever, which is something that I've been saying, regardless of what uh, the deal ends up being. Uh, Trump is going to say it is the greatest deal ever. But there was a lot of attention being paid to the deal, a lot of stories uh, coming out that were close to a deal. In fact, I read that they do have an agreement on exchange rates, currencies. Obviously, uh, we like to, or the U.S. likes to accuse China of being a currency manipulator. And so maybe there's some type of deal that says they won't manipulate the currency. They won't uh, use their currency as a weapon, which is something that China wasn't going to do anyway. To the extent that we win any concessions from the Chinese where they agree not to uh, weaken their currency, that, that basically amounts to nothing. In fact, a weak currency is bad for China. What helps China is in appreciating yuan. And in fact, that's actually going to end up hurting the United States because it's going to increase the cost of the goods that we import from China. Goods that a lot of Americans depend on are going to be more expensive as the Chinese currency gets higher. And in fact, one of the, the points of the deal that I've been reading about has to do with the Chinese government committing to some level of imports of U.S. products. You know, maybe I think one, 1. 1.2 trillion, something like that I've heard over the next 10 years. So over a hundred billion dollars a year of products that the Chinese government is agreeing that China is going to import. Now, I don't even know how they can police that or how they can guarantee that that's going to happen, uh, you know, because the Chinese government doesn't control the amount of American products that individual Chinese consumers wish to buy. So I don't know how they can guarantee any uh, particular level of, of imports from the United States. But my guess is whatever the Chinese end up importing is what they were going to import anyway. I mean, all, basically what they're agreeing to do is import what they would have imported even if there was no agreement. And of course, if you look at the list of products that the Chinese are going to be buying, it's mainly going to be things that we grow or dig out of the ground, you know, raw materials, uh, scrap metal, agricultural products. I mean, if you actually look at the, the things that are traded, if you look at the trading relationship with the United States and uh, China, we look like a colony of China, right? And China looks like the industrial power and we're their, you know, their poor colony because we export raw materials and we import finished manufactured goods. Uh, so the Chinese are going to buy uh, more of our raw materials and agricultural products. And in fact, if the Chinese currency appreciates significantly over the next 10 years against the dollar, which is my expectation, well, then it's going to be easier and easier for China to meet these numbers. Because the lower the dollar goes and the stronger the yuan is, the easier it is for the Chinese to import a particular uh, dollar level of goods. I mean, maybe if they had agreed to import a particular amount of yuan denominated goods, that would be one thing. But if the dollar is going to lose value and dollars are cheaper and cheaper, well, then inflation is going to be one of the reasons that the Chinese are going to be buying more stuff from America. But the reality is we won't be earning more yuan for those exports. And that is the goal of exports. Exporting is a means to an end. The ends are paying for your imports. Now, America, we haven't had to pay for all of our imports with exports. We've just been able to create money out of thin air because we create the reserve currency. Well, our days of being able to do that 
are numbered. Well, meanwhile, the markets were excited about this. Uh, Donald Trump held uh, a kind of a press conference today in in the Oval Office uh, talking about this deal. And I guess that was exciting for the markets that, you know, a trade deal is is imminent and it's going to be a great deal. But as I've been saying, the markets have been rallying on the prospects of an end to the trade war and some type of deal for many, many months now. And so the reality is when we actually get a deal, it's going to be buy the rumor, sell the facts. So if you think a trade deal is good for the markets, well, then you've already bought because a trade deal is a done is a sure thing. In fact, Donald Trump said he thought the odds were better that we would have a deal than not. In fact, Chinese vice premier basically said the same thing. Of course, I've been saying there's going to be a deal. Because it's the easiest thing to do is have a deal, right? The deal's not going to accomplish anything, just like NAFTA too, the USMCA, but that's not going to stop Trump from claiming it's a great deal. But we know we can't have these punitive tariffs because the U.S. consumer can't afford to pay them. And so Trump can't afford not to have a deal. It would be political suicide to put those tariffs on. So he needs a deal. We're going to have a deal. And of course, since it's clear we're going to have a deal, everybody buying stocks knows we're going to have a deal. So the deal is already priced into the market. So when we have a deal, well, now there's nothing left to anticipate. All you can do is sell. But, you know, I think more important than the talk about a trade deal was a lot of the Fed speak today. You had a lot of Fed officials that were talking, James Bullard, um, Clarita, John Williams, they were all talking. And the real common theme today was inflation. And I've been talking about this for years. How was the Federal Reserve going to basically respond to inflation above their 2% target, which we know eventually it's going to be? I mean, the real rate of inflation has probably been above 2%. In fact, I'm confident it's been above 2% every year, except the way they score inflation uh, many years, the CPI was below, or the the, the, the measures that the Fed uses, uh, the chain-weighted personal consumption expenditure index, whatever they decide to use, the number was below 2%. And But I said, well, what is the Fed going to do when it's above 2%? Because eventually it's going to be so high that even the government's own gimmick doctored up uh, numbers are not going to be able to show a, a rate below 2%. And I said, well, they're going to tolerate it. Because there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, they, they, they can't fight inflation. They put themselves in a box where fighting inflation is impossible. Look, they had to stop raising interest rates at two and a quarter percent because the stock market cratered into a bear market and because the U.S. economy is going towards recession. We got more bad economic news on yesterday, which I will get to. But if the Fed had to cut off rate hikes at two and a quarter percent, how are they going to fight inflation? I mean, what if they had to raise interest rates to five or six or seven or eight or 10 percent? It's impossible. So the Fed could talk all they want, right? They could bark all they want about how they would fight inflation if it ever reared its ugly head, but they can't bite. And, and today, what you had these Fed officials talking about was how are they going to respond to the threat that we don't have enough inflation, right? That inflation expectations may be too low and they talked about making adjustments to their 2% target in that it's not a 2% target on an annual basis, but they want to change it. And I, they've spoken about this in the past. They want to change it so their target is that inflation averages 2%. And why they're doing that is because they want to look back to all the years over the past 10 years or so where the inflation official measures of inflation were less than 2%. And what they want to do now is allow the future inflation rate to be above 2%, right above the target, because it'll all average out. We want to make up for all the past years where there wasn't enough inflation by having excess inflation in the future, and then it's all going to even out, which is all a bunch of nonsense. Because if we only had 1% inflation one year instead of 2%, that's not a problem. We don't need to make up for that by having 3% in a future year. So we bring the average up to 2%. I mean, why? 
why do we want the cost of living to go up? I mean, I've spoken about that many times on this podcast in the past. This is all ridiculous. Inflation is not a good thing. 2% is not better than 1%. 1% is not better than zero. When it comes to inflation, no inflation is better than any inflation. And in fact, when it comes to inflation, deflation is better than no inflation. And again, inflation, deflation aren't even the right words. Inflation is an expansion of the money supply. Deflation is a contraction. The government is talking about the cost of living. When they're talking about inflation, they're talking about the cost of living, the consumer price index. And when it comes to consumer prices, the lower the better. You don't want consumer prices to go up. If they go up, that's bad. If they go up more, that's worse. What consumers want are lower prices. All consumers want lower prices. And a falling cost of living means a rising standard of living. That's what we want to go up, our standard of living. We don't want it to go up. To, we, don't, we don't want it to cost us more. We want it to cost us less. The less things cost, the more we can buy. The more we can buy, the higher our standard of living. So the two go hand in hand, and they're opposites. A falling cost of living equates to a rising standard of living. Well, why would we want our standard of living to rise more slowly by imposing an increasing cost of living? This is all Fed speak. This is all nonsense to try to pretend that we're better off with rising prices than stable prices or that we're better off with stable prices than falling prices. You know, and I've talked about all the nonsense where they say, well, if prices don't go up, nobody's going to buy. People are going to just hold off indefinitely waiting for prices to get lower and lower, which is complete nonsense. People buy what they need when they need it and when they want it. The only time people don't buy something because they're waiting for the price to go down is when they can't afford the current price. Right? If something is too expensive, you don't buy it until the price comes down. Right? When the first uh, plasma TV came out, flat screen TV came out, I remember seeing it in a store. It was $10,000, which was a lot of money like 20 years ago or 25 years ago when I, I first saw one. I forget when it was. And yeah, I thought it was really cool. And I would have liked to have had one. But I didn't buy it because the price was too high. I couldn't afford it. So I waited. But there were plenty of very wealthy people back then who bought those TVs, knowing full well the price was going to go down. They bought it anyway because they wanted to be the first one to have it. Right? I mean, think about the very first television set that somebody bought. I mean, the screen was like two inches big. It was in black and white and all grainy, and there was nothing on. I think maybe they had programming for one or two hours a day. I mean, that was it. And the TVs cost as much as a car. Yet people bought them. No way, right? The rich people bought them. Poor people didn't buy them. Middle class people didn't buy them. They didn't buy them until the price went down. It's falling prices that encourage people to buy, not rising prices. If the first TV were the cheapest TV, nobody would have ever owned them. The same thing for every product. What happens is products come out, they're expensive, a few rich people buy them, and now the companies earn some money, and they find a way to make things uh, more efficiently. They, they bring down the price, and as the price comes down, more people buy, and then companies make even more profits. In fact, they try to say that if prices are falling, companies can't make any money. That's BS, because when prices are falling, costs are falling. And when it comes to uh, sales, it's the margin that counts. Companies can make a lot more money selling products at lower prices if they do more volume. I mean, don't you think cell phone companies now make more money selling cell phones for a hundred bucks a phone, uh, you know, than when they were a thousand dollars a phone or two thousand dollars a phone? I mean, as you bring down the price, you expand your market and now you can make more money. So it's all BS, right? The reason that the central banks want inflation is not because it's good for the economy or good for the consumer. It's not. What they're trying to do is sustain asset bubbles and they're trying to wipe out debt. That's really what they're trying to do. They're trying to destroy the value of the debt that they encouraged everybody to take on. I mean, after all, when you have this much debt, inflation is your only way out. The only way to screw your creditors is to have inflation do it. I mean, if you're not going to default, then you need to inflate. And so that is the real reason that the Fed wants higher inflation, not because 
uh, a rising cost of living is good for the economy. It's not. It's lousy for the economy. But it's trying to help them paper over their mess to control this asset bubble. But it's not going to work, right? They're trying to say that, oh, we had inflation and it was under 2% for a number of years. Well, now we're going to make up for it. And so maybe we'll have 2.5%, 3% inflation for a while. And it's all going to average out to 2%. So it's all going to be good. It's not going to be good because they're going to get a lot more inflation than they bargained for, right? I mean, the, the, the Fed is basically trying to get the market a little bit pregnant when it comes to inflation. It's not, right? It's not. We're not going to get a little bit pregnant. We're going to get all the way pregnant because that's the only kind of pregnant you can be. And inflation is not going to stop at 2.5%, 3%. It's going to go a lot higher. It's going to be 4%. It's going to be 5%, 6%, 7%. There is no stopping it. All the Fed is doing now is preparing the markets for inflation to be north of 2%. But don't believe that it's going to stay anywhere close to 2%. But this is going to allow the Fed to get away with it a little longer because when the Fed doesn't immediately respond to rising inflation, the markets would have said, hey, what's going on? Why is the Fed allowing this? So now the Fed is getting out in front of it, right? There's an old expression, if you're getting chased out of out of town, right, run to the head of the crowd and make like you're leading the parade. So the Fed wants to lead the inflation parade so nobody uh, you know, questions why they're failing to do anything, except at some point it's going to get out of hand when inflation is obviously much higher than what the Fed bargains for. And of course, then they're going to have to make up another excuse as to why they're not doing anything about it. And I think it's kind of ironic, too, that you have all these Fed officials today talking about an absence of inflation, about the danger of people not... Uh, thinking there'll be enough inflation of inflation expectations becoming uh, unanchored on the downside and the Fed has to do something about it to make sure that we have an adequate amount of inflation. That was all happening on the same day when Kraft Heinz stock is down 27% on the day. Huge decline. In fact, this is the lowest the stock has been since the two companies merged about uh, five years ago. But the stock came crashing down and they, they missed on their earnings. And so they have to slash their dividend. But the company specifically cited an extraordinary inflation of 2018. Extraordinary inflation as the reason that they missed earnings because their costs went way up because of all the inflation uh, that was forcing up prices in 2018. So an extraordinary inflation. The Fed is talking about no inflation, yet Kraft Heinz, which deals with inflation in the real world, is saying inflation was extraordinary. It was so bad that we have to slash our dividend because we didn't earn enough money because we didn't raise our prices high enough to offset the increase in costs. And of course, what does that tell you about future prices for the consumer? There's going to be a lot of price increases coming to the consumer. And of course, one of the things that the Federal Reserve was saying today too about inflation was that one of the reasons that they thought that inflation was going to be so low was because oil prices were falling. Well, oil prices fell last year, but they're already up 27% this year. Oil closed above $57 a barrel. Why were oil prices falling late last year? Because everybody was afraid the Fed was going to keep on jacking up interest rates, then the dollar was going to keep rising, and that the Fed balance sheet reduction was on autopilot, and that was going to crowd out all the investment in the global economy, and oil was getting killed. Well, now that the Fed is no longer doing that, oil is coming back up, and I think oil prices are going to keep rising. In fact, this is probably going to be one of the biggest gains in one year in the price of oil, because I don't think we're anywhere near done. I mean, we could easily get back up to $80 a barrel before the end of this year, which would basically mean that oil prices would double on the year. On a year where the Fed is saying there's not enough inflation because of weak oil prices, and then you end up getting the price of oil double. And of course, this forecast will be much more likely to come true if we get a drop in the value of the dollar, which I believe is coming. You know, the dollar was down a little bit today, down again in the week. 96 and a half is uh, where the dollar index closed. The price of gold continues to gain. It rose today. It made up for a drop yesterday. It was down about $10, $12 yesterday, gained about five of it back. But I still think it finished the week up about $7 an ounce.
We closed about 1328 on the price of gold. Gold stocks were up again today, but not up nearly as much as they would have been, I believe, had Barrick Gold not basically expressed an interest in doing a hostile takeover of Newmont. And so that sent the price of Newmont up, but it sent the price of Barrick Gold down, and it also sent the price of Gold Corp down because if a barrack is able to do a hostile takeover of Newmont, then the deal for Gold Corp falls apart because Newmont is in the process of buying Gold Corp, uh, which is why Gold Corp went down. I mean, personally, even if that deal falls apart, I mean, I think it's great for Gold Corp because I thought that they got a bad deal anyway because I think Newmont was buying them too cheap, but they get like a $600 million breakup penalty, which is a lot of cash uh, that Barrick is going to have to pay Gold Corp if this deal gets scuttled or Newmont's going to have to pay, or I guess Barrick if they end up acquiring Newmont. But I think this kind of threw a monkey wrench into the whole uh, gold sector, or at least the major averages. Uh, but they still managed to close higher on the day. The GDX was up about a third of a percent, and the GDXJ, which are the junior miners, was up about four-tenths of a percent. Both indexes were higher earlier in the day when gold was actually up a little bit more as well. Uh, but they did close the day and the week higher. You know, while I'm talking about <laughs> Kraft Heinz. The Kraft family is having a lot of problems. Like Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, uh, I guess was arrested or charged uh, with soliciting prostitution. It is a misdemeanor, not a felony. And, you know, I, I, I wish that soliciting prostitution wasn't a crime at all. I don't believe that it should be a crime. I don't believe that prostitution should be a crime. I mean, in order to have a crime, you need a victim. And prostitution is a victimless crime. Now, I know a lot of people will say, no, 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 there's victims. The, the women are victims or society is a victim, but they're not. I mean, what causes the victimization is the laws that make prostitution illegal. See, if women are free, adult women, I'm not talking about kids. I'm talking about adults making a informed, voluntary decision to enter into a transaction. And if a woman voluntarily exchanges sex for money, then she's not a victim. She's just taking part in a, a transaction. But when you force this woman to do this illegally, because laws against prostitution don't end prostitution. I mean, prostitution is going to go on whether it's legal or not. It's just that if you have to drive it underground because you make it illegal, that's when women have problems. Now, all of a sudden, uh, they risk going to jail. So now they have to start having sex with the cops for free so they don't get arrested. And now they have to hire a pimp, right, who takes a big chunk of what they earn and maybe mistreats them. But why do women need pimps if they're a prostitute? Because if a John doesn't pay, they can't go to court. So they need the pimp. So women have it much worse when they are working as prostitutes illegally than if they could, you know, practice the world's oldest profession legally. And the same thing with society. I mean, prostitution would be a lot less public if it were legal, where it could take place indoors because you could legally advertise your services. When you make it illegal, and now you have street walkers, right? When prostitution is, is legal, you don't have to walk the streets to find customers. But when it's illegal and you can't run an ad, right, you can't have a place of business, well, then you're out in the street, and that, that actually is worse for society uh, to have that. So all of the problems that result from prostitution, the real problems, uh, basically stem from the fact that prostitution is illegal. And one of the other problems, too, is the war on drugs, where a lot of prostitutes are prostitutes to support their drug habit. So the government is forcing a lot of women into prostitution with the war on drugs by driving up the cost of drugs. If we didn't have the war on drugs, if it were legal to do drugs and drug prices came down, women could afford to buy the drugs that they needed without having to turn to prostitution. So a lot of the prostitution wouldn't exist, but for another victimless crime, which is uh, drugs. But I mean, the whole thing, if you if you read the story on Robert Kraft, he was he was arrested in a spa in, um, in, in, in Palm Beach, Florida. And apparently there are a lot of other big names, a lot of other famous people, wealthy people are apparently going to go down in this thing of this spa, which basically is giving out massages. 
And and to me, I mean, I don't know all the details, but I looked at some of the women uh, and, you know, in the spa and my guess. And, and I also I looked at what they were charging and they weren't really charging enough money uh, for this to be full blown prostitution. What I think was going on, I don't know for sure, but this is my guess, is all Robert Kraft was getting for his money was a happy ending. I mean, that's probably what he asked for. You have these women in there, they're giving massages and you're asking for the happy ending and now you're soliciting prostitution because that is considered an act of prostitution. This whole thing is ridiculous that this is even a crime. This is making national news that a bunch of older guys, you know, are getting their rocks off when they're getting a massage and and, and having a happy ending. Who cares? Who cares? Why is this a crime? This is a bunch of nonsense. I would like to see this stuff ended. We should, and I don't know why the left doesn't make a bigger push uh, for this. If you want, if you believe in freedom of choice, right? If people want to talk about how women have a right to choose, and everybody says, "Oh, you know, people, I'm, I'm in favor of uh, um, pro-choice," right? They they should be able to have an abortion. They should be able to choose to kill their unborn child if that's what they want, right? There are plenty of people who are pro-choice on that, but they're not pro-choice on whether or not they want to uh, sell uh, sex for money. I mean, why can't women use their body in that way? Why can't they choose? Uh, to sell their body. I mean, you know, nobody would uh, say that a woman can't, you know, marry for money, that a woman can't date a guy who has a lot of money. Well, I mean, why not just cut out the pretense and just charge the guy, just have him be a customer, just, you know, keep it above board instead of a quid pro quo. Uh, But anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on this podcast just about talking about why I believe that prostitution uh, should uh, should be uh, should be legalized, but I only brought it up because uh, uh, Robert Kraft and because of the problems that uh, Kraft Heinz was having. So I guess when it when it rains, it pours. When you're uh, a Kraft, I want to get in though to some of the bad economic news that came out on Thursday because there was certainly no shortage of it. In fact, we did see several big Wall Street firms ratchet down their estimates for Q4 and Q1 GDP as a result of the numbers that came out yesterday. In fact, the Atlanta Fed notched theirs down from 1.5 to 1.4, which is now their estimate for growth for the fourth quarter of 2018, which I think would bring the entire year to no better than 2.8%. So if the Atlanta Fed is right, Donald Trump will still fail to achieve the 3% annualized growth that he is so critical of Barack Obama for failing to achieve. He's not going to achieve it either. And as I said on a previous podcast, uh, he's not going to achieve it at all uh, during his uh, his term, which I believe is going to just be one, not two, because 2018, whatever the GDP growth is uh, from 2018, that is going to be the high water mark of the Trump presidency. It is all downhill from here. We got the durable goods numbers. This was for the month of December. So this was a delayed report that was not released due to the government shutdown that we just got. And they were looking for a gain of 1% uh, in new orders, which we got 1.2. So that was a little better. But where the the, uh, numbers got bad, ex-transportations, it was reduced to a gain of just 0.1. Uh, which was about half the gain that they were expecting of a gain 0.2. But the real bad number was core capital goods. They were expecting the number to be unchanged following the November decline of 0.6. Instead, they revised the November decline to a full percentage point from 0.6. And December's number was another drop of 0.7. So the drop in December was actually higher then the unrevised drop in November, which was now revised to minus one. So that was some bad numbers, back-to-back declines in, in, in core capital goods. Philadelphia Fed, that was probably the, the biggest the shocker on the day. The uh, February number that we got on Thursday, it followed a 17. That was the number in uh, January. The way the index works, anything above zero would indicate an expansion in local area manufacturing. Anything below zero is a contraction. So the prior month, January was 17. The consensus was for 14 in February. We got minus 4.1. So we actually contracted in the Philly Fed. That was a bad sign. Also got existing home sales. 
they were looking for a slight increase over the prior month. This was a January number. They were looking for an increase. Instead, they got a decrease. Uh, month over month, sales were down 1.2%. Year over year, down 8.5%. We are now at a three-year low in existing home sales and heading lower. And in fact, even the leading economic indicators, which I think are a lot more lagging than leading, even though they do have a separate set of lagging indicators, but they were looking uh, for a plus 0.1%. And they got a minus 0.1, although the prior's minus 0.1 was revised up to unchanged. So I don't know that this number was, uh, you know, a miss or not when you average them out. But, you know, uh, leading indicators of zero or minus 0.1, they don't look good. So all the indicators are pointing south to a weakening economy. And I think it's very interesting that in all the Fed speak, when they're talking about the rationalization for their 180 degree about, you know, face, In addition to saying that there's low inflation when clearly there's not and talking about falling oil prices when oil prices are already up 27% on the year, they keep talking about a softening global economy, a softening global economy. They never talk about a softening domestic economy because the domestic economy is really softening, yet they want to deflect attention from that. They want to pretend that they're worried about the global economy not the U.S. economy, because I guess they're afraid of scaring people by admitting how weak the U.S. economy really is. So they're trying to kind of save face by claiming that it's the weakness in the global economy that they're concerned about. Well, if it was just weakness in the global economy, well, they should be uh, you know, pursuing policy that is um, appropriate for the United States. I mean, right? I mean, they're uh, the America's central bank. I mean, even though we do have the world's reserve currency, uh, our primary uh, goal should be appropriate policy for the U.S. economy. But the reality is, I mean, maybe you could say that they're they're worried that the weakness abroad is going to spill over to the United States. I mean, what's probably happening is the reverse. Maybe some of the weakness in the U.S. is what's spilling over abroad. But I actually do think now that the Fed is no longer tightening interest rates and threatening to gl- drain global liquidity, I do think we're going to see a pickup in the global economy. But that is not going to benefit the U.S. economy. I think the U.S. economy is already headed into recession, uh, and which is why I believe, or one of the reasons I believe, that the Fed is not simply going to stop hiking rates, but they're going to be aggressively reducing them back to zero. It's not simply that they're going to end the uh, balance sheet rundown, qu- you know, quantitative tightening, as a lot of people have been calling it, but they're going to ramp up another round of quantitative easing because that's the only way that they can attempt uh, to prevent this bubble from deflating. Now, I don't think that they're going to succeed because I don't think they can blow a bubble big enough to paper over the last one. I think this is going to be the one that causes the dollar to collapse, and then we end up with a currency crisis and a sovereign debt crisis, which is going to be Uh, much, much worse than uh, the financial crisis that we had in 2008. I want to finish up the podcast, though, again, by uh, having an update on the Jesse Smollett saga. As I expected on my last podcast, the Chicago PD did successfully uh, get a grand jury to indict Smollett for filing a false police report, disorderly conduct. And I think that the police department did a phenomenal job of detective work of basically uncovering every aspect of of this hoax, of this crime. The, The most amazing part about it is Smollett is still in denial. He is still claiming that he is innocent and that he didn't do it probably in the face of the most evidence that I've ever seen laid out by a police department or a, or a prosecutor on one individual. And by the way, Smollett's um, lawyers are now basically accusing the Chicago PD of trampling all over uh, the presumption of innocence and how dare they just you know, say that he's guilty. I mean, he's presumed innocent and we haven't even had a trial yet, which of course is a bunch of nonsense. The presumption of innocence has to do with the jury. The jury has to presume somebody is innocent until the facts prove them guilty. Not the police. I mean, the police don't, you know, arrest people that they think are innocent. They arrest you if they if they think you're guilty. If they think you're innocent, they don't arrest you. The same thing for prosecutors. Prosecutors are not supposed to prosecute somebody if they don't think they're guilty. 
right? So the prosecution looks at all the evidence, and only if they believe a defendant is guilty do they prosecute the case. In fact, prosecutors are supposed to look at all the evidence, including the exculpable evidence, which would be evidence that would exonerate somebody. And if they don't think that somebody did it, they're not supposed to charge them anyway. You're not supposed to file charges against somebody who you think is innocent. You're supposed to be convinced that they're guilty. If you're not convinced they're guilty, then you don't bring the charges. So it's ridiculous to say that the police should say, yes, this guy is, is presumed innocent, but we've indicted him anyway. I mean, they're sitting on a mountain of evidence. Now, what they have to do under the American legal system is now that they have a case, now that they've built up all this evidence, they need to take this evidence before a jury, right, who hasn't seen it yet. And then, based on all of this evidence, they need to convince the jury, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Smollett is guilty. They start off with the presumption of innocence, right? And now the government has the burden of proving guilt. And if the government doesn't meet that burden, well, then he'll be acquitted. But to say that the police have to say they think the guy is innocent, that's crazy. And, of course, the public can form its own perceptions based on the information that is out there. And the information that is out there, I mean, this guy is guilty as sin. I mean, there's no way that this guy didn't do it. I can't think of a possible explanation where this guy can somehow, you know, get off. Now, what Smollett should really be doing, you know, if he got any decent legal advice, he should just be confessing and apologizing. I mean, unless somehow he thinks he's going to beat this in O.J. Simpson style and there are people who are going to think that he's innocent, look, he already is a liar. I mean, the, the best lie that Smollett could come up with now Right. This is what I, this is what I guess I would do if I was this guy. Of course, if I was this guy, I wouldn't have done any of it. So, but I mean, this is what he should do. He should say he should call a press conference and he should apologize. But what he should say is, look, there are rumors about the fact that I was motivated from greed. Right. I was just trying to get a better salary, which I'll get to that in a moment. But he should say, look, the reason I did this is because I know there are so many hate crimes that are being committed, so much violence against blacks, against homosexuals, but it's committed against poor people who are not famous and nobody knows about it. And so it's not getting reported, it's getting overlooked. And so what I did is I decided to fake this crime, knowing that because I'm a famous person, all of a sudden it would focus attention on these hate crimes, on on uh, violence against blacks and violence against homosexuals and all the racism. And of course, all this would have been a lie, but the media would eat this up, right? They would say, oh, at least you had good intentions. Your heart was in the right place. What were you thinking? Yes, this was kind of dumb for you to lie. But yes, you were doing it for a greater good. You had a cause. You were kind of sacrificing yourself, right, for the greater good, right? You were creating this fake crime, right, to, 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 to draw attention and to call attention to all the unreported actual crimes that are taking place, which of course all would have been bullshit, but you know what? The, the media would eat it up. The left would eat it up. Instead, the guy wants to pretend that he didn't do it, which is complete nonsense if you look at all of the evidence against him. I mean, these guys laid it out. They got him cold. I mean, first of all, remember I reported that the two Nigerian brothers were paid $3,500 uh, to you know, participate in this hoax. Smollett paid them with a personal check. I mean, come on. I mean, the check is there. They got the canceled check. I mean, why didn't he pay cash? I mean, obviously, he's not a, you know, a career criminal. He, he doesn't understand that they should use cash. But obviously, it didn't even dawn on Smollett. In his wildest dreams, he never thought that the police would figure this out. I mean, he didn't think that they were going to ever question these two Nigerian brothers. So it didn't matter that he wrote them a check. Because after all, right, he told the police that the people who did it were white. So why would they even suspect these two black guys when he told them that the people were white? So in his wildest dreams, he didn't think. That's why he didn't cover his tracks. That's why he wasn't worried about using his cell phone. The police have cell phone and text messages between Smollett and these two brothers up until even an hour before the assault, and then like an hour after the assault. And then he was communicating with them when they were in Nigeria. And 
they, they basically found that the whole attack was coordinated based on when these guys were leaving because they had already booked their tickets a couple of months in advance. And so they had to do it before they left town and he wanted to do it on a certain date. And according to the text messages, originally they were supposed to do the fake attack at 10 p.m. But Smollett's flight was delayed. And so he had to change the time to 2 a.m. because his flight coming in from L.A. was late. And, but all this is they have all the, the text messages back and forth. I mean, they got this guy cold. You know, they've got the video surveillance of the two brothers buying the ski masks, buying the rope. I mean, I mean, they have all the, the material out there. I mean, everything is on film. They've got all the cameras from taxi cabs that they use, street cameras that they use. They got the records from the Uber ride share. And, you know, and the police, again, figured out, like I said, that it was Smollett's intention that the whole thing be filmed. That's why he staged it right below where he knew a camera was. He just didn't realize the camera was pointing in the other direction. He thought the whole thing was going to be on film, and when it wasn't on film, that was a problem for him because that was supposed to be his evidence that it took place. And he knew that if it was on film and people could see him getting beaten up and fighting back, which was a big part of it, he told the brothers, hey, let me fight back. Let me look like a hero. Let me look like, you know, I'm not a coward and I scared you off, which is another crazy thing about it. Because according to uh, Smollett, his case is going to have to be that these two Nigerian brothers just attacked him, right? That he didn't orchestrate it. They just decided on their own without ever talking to him to attack him and put a noose around his head and pour uh, bleach on him and, and, and fight him but lose, right? Like these two huge guys meant to attack Smollett, but, you know, they, 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 could, they, they, they ran away scared because he, he fought him off in 45 seconds. I mean, none of that makes sense. The only thing that makes sense is the truth that was told to them by these two cooperating witnesses. And I'm also sure that when the police questioned these two Nigerian brothers, they sequestered them, right? They had one in one room and one in another, and they asked them the same questions, and I'm sure their answers matched, right? So they, they could tell that nobody is lying, right? You don't question them in the same room. You separate them, and then you get the story. And so their story makes sense. Smollett's story makes no sense at all. Yet here he is, you know, he's out there pretending, pretending that he's still innocent. He's going to take this thing, force the, the, the uh, city of Chicago. And I thought the, 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 was it the police chief who gave the press conference did an excellent job uh, uh, in that press conference. But he's already talking about all of the resources that the, that the police have wasted on prosecuting a fake hate crime all of the detectives, all of the work that has been done. And now when they caught him red-handed, when they pieced together the entire thing, right, it's an open and shut slam dunk case that the guy is guilty. He's going to make Chicago go through a trial, have a jury, right? And now, of course, they have to find a jury that hasn't even heard about this. They got to find a Chicago jury that doesn't know about this case. How hard is it going to be to find that jury, right? To pick that jury, sequester that jury, right? Have an entire, how much more money is going to be wasted? The guy should be pleading guilty. This is so ridiculous. And the, the other ridiculous part about it is there were rumors for a while that he was doing this because he was going to get fired from Empire, right? They were writing him out of the script and then, and, and Empire said, no, no, that's nonsense. Well, the real truth came out is that what happened was Smollett was not happy with his salary level. And he wanted more money. He's making $65,000 an episode, which is a lot of money. I mean, he does his 18 episodes in a season. That's over $1 million a year for a part-time job because he can still make money doing other things. So he's making over a million dollars a year play acting, right? I mean, one of the easiest things you could do is just act in a TV series. I mean, how hard could that be if you have some talent, right? If you were, you know, born with some acting talent and you get lucky, you can get a great job like that. This guy ought to be thankful that he's making over a million dollars a year, but it wasn't enough. 
he wanted to negotiate a higher salary. And what he thought was, hey, if I can make myself real famous, right, if I can be this victim of this hate crime, well, that's going to raise my stock, right? I'm going to be more valuable because a lot more people are going to want to watch Empire to see the brave victim who fought off the, you know, the, the white uh, racist, right? And so he does this thing uh, in order to uh, make you know, make himself more valuable so he has a better bargaining position, which I think just really lays this out, uh, you know, more liberal hypocrisy because he is a big liberal, a big Democrat, right? He's probably publicly denounces greedy capitalists and greedy businessmen and all they care about is profits and they don't care about people. Well, what a hypocrite because did this guy give a damn about people? Did he, this guy care about any violence that he might have incited? Did this guy care about fanning the flames of the racial divide and you know all the the, the you know the, the race uh, attention that's going on in the United States? He was throwing fuel on that fire all for his own greed. Also, he could make more money than the million plus he's already making, right? I mean, that's I mean. He's criticizing probably honest businessmen for being greedy. All they're, they're being honest. Everybody is greedy. The problem is when you're this greedy and you're willing to resort to faking a hate crime, right? So you can have a little bit more for yourself and you don't care about how much damage your uh, conduct causes to other people. That's bad greed. That's evil greed. Right. If I'm just greedy and that I want more for myself and more for my family and I earn my money the honest way by uh, providing people with goods and services that they want and making their lives better and I earn my money, that's great. Right. That's the Gordon Gecko greed is good speech. This kind of greed where you resort to a crime like this with callous disregard of the consequences of your action. This is the hypocrisy of the left. You know, one more thing that uh, this makes me think of when it comes to liberals and uh, socialists or the left that were so quick to believe this ridiculous story the minute they heard it, right? Well, because the left, they, they believe all sorts of nonsense. Everything they believe is nonsense. Look, the idea that two white, racist, homophobic, empire-watching Trump supporters would be roaming around an upscale Chicago neighborhood at two in the morning in sub-zero temperatures carrying bleach and a noose, right? <laughs> that makes as much sense as all the crazy laws and government programs that the left supports, right? They haven't stopped to think about it. They don't question, right? Hey, if it sounds good, they go with it. And this initial story fit the narrative perfectly, and so they went with it, right? They, they, they don't think with their heads, right? It's like it's what they want to be true. And that's the same thing with socialism and all these well-intentioned, feel-good programs that they support. It's just as much nonsense as this. But they're not doing any reflection. I haven't heard any of that, you know, on any of the networks. I mean, again, I see more outrage uh, than anything else at people who are supposedly happy that the hate crime didn't take place and still trying to defend Smollett by saying, well, if he did this, right? You see all of these protesters, well, well, if he did this, if he did this, I mean, come on, right? I mean, you got these other two Nigerian brothers. Are they liars? Look at the police, the whole Chicago Police Department. You think they would be indicting this guy if they didn't have an ironclad case? And I'm sure the Chicago Police Department did not want this to be a hoax. Although I'm sure they weren't happy about the fact that this type of, uh, you know, uh, racial attacks would be taking place in Chicago. Uh, but, you know, they, they don't want to be known for this hoax. Uh, so, I mean, are all these guys, all these detectives, they're all lying? For what purpose would they be lying? The only person who had an incentive to lie was Smollett because he wanted, to be, he wanted more fame. He wanted more money. What's the incentive for all the liberals to believe him? Because they want to advance their agenda. And they're still trying to advance their agenda. And they're trying to minimize the impact uh, of, of this hoax. I'm hoping that we can maximize the impact of the hoax in that it could be used to try to prevent the left from doing this again. Just on a final note here. Uh, tomorrow, the 23rd of February, would have been my father, Erwin Schiff's 91st birthday. And it's hard to believe. Uh, he's I think he died four years ago. You know, I don't recall off the top of my head the date of the date of his passing. I don't necessarily like to, um, you know, talk about 
that or remember the day that he died, although I wish I could forget it. I mean, that whole day is is seared into my mind, and I wish I could forget some of the images of that day. But I, I'd rather, you know, talk about or remember him on the day that he was born. I mean, I obviously wasn't around when he was born, but I do have memories of birthdays and just, uh, you know, wishing him a happy birthday. I wish so many of my dad's birthdays had not been spent uh, behind bars, and I wish he could have had more birthdays because I wish he would have uh, been been freed. In fact, I, you know, had my father uh, not been imprisoned, I believe he still would be alive. I, I think the reason that he died was because the, the government doctors didn't take care of him. Right. I mean, basically, they allowed a skin cancer uh, to to grow and spread without taking care of it. And it you know, spread to his lungs and many other organs in his body while he was in a government hospital. You know, in fact, the reason that my father was in a hospital in Texas, uh, the reason they transferred him so far away from his family uh, was because they wanted to put him in a medical facility. And of course, he got no medical attention whatsoever. For, so all of you who think that, hey, we should turn over health care to the U.S. government, well, I turned over or we turned over involuntarily my father's health care to the U.S. government, and he died of skin cancer, right? Nobody, nobody did anything. Nobody treated him. Nobody, even though he was there in a medical hospital with doctors all around him, that's how incompetent government is and you know you should read the article if you haven't read it it's on the internet somewhere death of a patriot i mean my father died uh with a handcuff around his ankle even though he couldn't move and he couldn't breathe he was you know going to the bathroom through tubes uh in a bag and he was breathing through a tube that was down his throat there was no physical way that he can get out of bed yet not only did they have an armed guard in his room but they had a handcuff around his leg uh you know why Right? It's government. Government doesn't, you know, doesn't function rationally. They probably had these rules that they apply regardless of the situation. Sure, if you got a young, strong, healthy person, you know, who, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a hospital, okay, yeah, let's, you know, put a handcuff on him or put an armed guard. You got an 87 year old person who can't even move. Obviously, none of that is needed. But um, you can read that article. That's up there. But I just wanted to mention that my dad would have uh, turned uh, 91 tomorrow on Saturday, February 23rd. And again, I always think of him on on that date. And of course, I always remembered my father's birthday because it's exactly one month before my own. My father was born on February 23rd and I was born on March 23rd. This March 23rd, I'm going to be celebrating my birthday uh, at sea. I'm going to be on the Real Estate Guys Summit at Sea. Um, it's probably too late if you haven't uh, booked a passage on the summit at sea. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know if there's any cabins left. I think we set sail in a few weeks. We leave on March 15th uh, from Fort Lauderdale. March 15th happens to be my mother's birthday, and she's going to be on the cruise with me as well as, as uh, also my wife, a couple of my kids. So the whole shift family will be there. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you think you have uh, nine days free to, to float around the Caribbean, uh, you might be able to sign up uh, if there's still some cabins available. And if there are not, there is, I think there's a one day, if you're in the Fort Lauderdale area, on the 14th, I think there's a one day uh, uh, speaking thing uh, at the hotel. I forget where it is, but check it out at, uh, you know, at uh, shiftbirthday.com. But if you're in the Fort Lauderdale area, you can come by and just hear the talk. You don't have to go on the entire cruise. You can just come to the land event, which is a one day. Thank you.